I guess it only makes sense to start off this video by asking, are you ready for a good time? 2019 marked the beginning of the SmackDown on Fox era, where WWE and the Fox Broadcasting Company entered a five-year partnership to bring WWE's second longest-running weekly episodic television show to a brand new network. In June of 2018, after two years of negotiations, it was announced that Raw would be retained by the USA Network until 2024, while Fox would shell out $205 million a year until that same year to bring SmackDown to their family of programming. Not only that, but the show would go back to its Friday time slot after spending three years as a live production airing on Tuesdays. However, it almost ended up on the biggest sports station in North America as ESPN gave the WWE a look, but they couldn't come to terms. The reason was said to have been scheduling related based on how it's tough for a sports channel that carries so much programming throughout the year to give WWE the assurance that they would have the same day and time every week without interruption. It would have been huge for ESPN as they would have had both the UFC TV rights and SmackDown at the same time. But when Penn was put to paper, it was Fox that scooped up the show and following the announcement of the deal, the rollout to launch day started. There was brief speculation that this would be the new logo for the show as it appeared on promotional material, but it just ended up being a placeholder for what was a much cleaner Friday Night SmackDown design. Fox ran their We Are All Superstars campaign with appearances from Snoop Dogg and Stone Cold wanting to hammer home that everyone was a superstar in their own right, showing people from all walks of life at their jobs with the undertone that everyday tasks make people superstars. They also dropped a trailer teasing both Stone Cold and Hulk Hogan for the premiere episode, but none of those two appeared on the first SmackDown on Fox. WWE was so busy with the move that they forgot to announce matches for the upcoming Hell in a Cell that same weekend. The presentation and stage was given an overhaul with ACDC's Are You Ready as the new theme song and a short-lived but very eye-popping stage as the centerpiece of this new era. We came to the Staples Center where Vince McMahon and Stephanie McMahon welcomed us into Fox. Fox. The two big selling points for the show were one, Brock Lesnar wrestling on a weekly TV show for the first time since 2004, and The Rock making a cameo for the first time since SmackDown last rebranded, that was in the year of 2016. But with that setup out of the way, it's time to dive into the WWE's five years on the station, and this was literally about as mixed bag and as inconsistent as you could possibly get. There's points where you sit back and you go, damn, they're crushing it every single week, I'm intrigued by the stories, there's so much star our power and then there's points where you want to turn off the channel because the show was soulless and 2019 smackdown was pretty soulless the rock and becky lynch kicked things off by ripping into baron corbin then of the king variety calling him a super tough dude the rock doing his thing pumping up the crowd like only he can with an std joke before things ended in a beatdown Kevin Owens and Shane McMahon capped off their rivalry with a ladder match. The loser would have their WWE contract terminated in storyline. This after Owens spent the summer fighting to suppress Shane McMahon's ego trip, finally getting the best of him once and for all on this night. When things got going on this new network, one thing that really stands out was this internal thought process that both Fox and WWE were trying to lure in non-WWE fans, fans who liked boxing or MMA. The first two attempts were made on this night. First, by having Tyson Fury hop the guardrail and eye down Braun Strowman, which led to a match at Crown Jewel. And the second of these instances came in the main event. Of course, this is the night where Kofi infamously got brocked, losing his WWE title within the blink of an eye. And that was it for Kofi as a WWE title contender. It's rough watching back the next SmackDown because you see Kofi relegated into the tag team division without any mention of what the guy had just done for the past number of months. I get it, the rain was extremely middling, but still. So we get the great Fox mauling of 2019. Then after this, out comes Cain Velasquez, the history being that Cain beat Brock in UFC. Rey Mysterio saunters down the ramp with him like he's confronting the school bully who took his lunch money by bringing in his dad. And that was episode number one. I feel like as a premiere, it was all right. It started off well, but looking at things big picture, there's better episodes in this timeline alone that aren't advertised to be as big as this one was. Moving over to the WWE draft, which came to us on the road to Survivor Series, because, you know, there's nothing better than having a guy who was on Raw for like a year tell you how much they love SmackDown after having been on the brand for like a month. 
However, in this case, they tried to build this draft up a little differently as somewhat of an authentic sports draft, if you will. Now being on Fox, they had the company's analysts and commentators scrap together a lot of attributes that you'd hear scouts, GMs, and analysts talking about when it came to one of the big four North American sports leagues. It was corny because you could tell these guys had no interest in talking WWE. They were in it because they were forced to with the show being on their network. And secondly, just spoon fed what to say without any real pulse on the product. The draft was also framed as this TV channel war, USA executives, Fox executives, which one will prevail. The broadcast crew telling us that the suits had a say in who went where. SmackDown got Roman Reigns, Bray Wyatt, Braun Strowman, Sasha Banks, Daniel Bryan, Brock Lesnar, and Bayley as their main draft selections. And it was Bailey who was the talking point following the draft episode because she went full commando on her Bailey buddies and for the first time in her WWE career, axed her character. Literally. This was the night that the hugger died and the role model was born. She won the SmackDown Women's Championship a few days after losing it to Charlotte and we all know what happens once you lose to Charlotte, people do not stay the same. This kicked off a 380 day title reign and with Sasha Banks back on the show, the creative team made a great decision by having them pair back up after they missed the boat the first time on Raw. We also got a justification for Bailey's heel turn which in an era of random shock value turns was a welcome change. It was like a girl who had just outgrown certain things in her life, as simple as that. It goes hand in hand with the previous iteration of the character. Speaking of justifications for doing something, how about a very tiny man destined to fight for his dreams? A man that will go down swinging and won't let his height define him. Now you're probably thinking, Daniel Bryan, maybe Rey Mysterio, maybe Hornswoggle, but I'm talking about Shorty Gable. Get it? Because he's short. That's the joke. He's tiny. Are, are you laughing yet? Probably not because you're not Vince McMahon. Here's the baseline of what goes down with our boy Chad every single week. Someone makes fun of his height. He's like, damn, bro. Why'd you say that? And it leads to a match. Oh, and he's also dressed like a creator wrestler you made when you were like five at 4 a.m. on a Saturday morning and then just never used. Gable was a member of Team Hogan as we built to crown Jewel and these guys out of the blue just decided to run this five on five match so that Hogan and Flair could be in Saudi but didn't have to take any bumps. Thank God for that because watching them wrestle would have literally been like that time on Futurama where Zoidberg shed his skin. As Crown Jewel came to a wrap the following day, we got one of the most memorable SmackDowns in this era. The night NXT TakeOver became much more than just a name. With a majority of the roster stranded in Saudi Arabia because of a delayed flight and 14 hours ahead of them, Survivor Series season kicked off by shining a spotlight on the stars of the black and gold brand. Something that WWE only did once for Survivor Series. WWE needed a workaround to get one world title off of SmackDown as Bray Wyatt had won the Universal Championship off of Seth Rollins, so Brock Lesnar quit and went hunting, presumably for deer in Saskatchewan, but also Rey Mysterio on Raw. NXT talents crashed multiple matches with a lot of the big hitters getting their time to shine. The show concluded with an excellent match between Adam Cole and Daniel Bryan for the NXT title. But of course, at the end, Triple H... Uh declared war uh, on a raw you get the deal you you get the deal and he's also terminally online but relax no matter how terminally online triple h is nowadays he wasn't the one that had to bear the brunt of the next storyline survivor series can't be survivor series without the classic without the pillar without the rivalry that beats all other rivalries can they coexist this time kansas man versus Florida man. If you're eating right now, I'd suggest you stop. Baron Corbin calls out the big dog Roman Reigns over having little testicles and told Roman that he'd beat the crap out of him so bad that everyone in the arena could take out their doggy poop bags and scoop up the big dog's feces and take them home as souvenirs. Things then got much more dangerous because we got the trio of Baron Corbin, Dolph Ziggler, and Bobby Roode bringing out a man dressed as a dog to really crank the dial up to 10 for this feud. On the other side of things, with Bray Wyatt now as the top dog on SmackDown, he moved into a program with Daniel Bryan. The deep-rooted story being conveyed was that Bryan was just as deranged, just as unstable as The Fiend. He just didn't let it out, and he didn't know that he was an absolute killer. That's the whole reason he changed in the first place. That's the cause for why he wasn't doing the Yes Chant anymore, and Bray wanted to unlock that old Bryan. 
This later brought Miz into the fold by using the past history of Brian and Mr. MTV as a launching point. Bray attacked Miz's family by performing spooky voodoo to his child's crib. And of course, Miz doesn't know that when you're in a real life horror movie and you see a half open door, you don't open the rest of it. Family was a big theme on SmackDown during this time. Lacey Evans continued to get her mega push. And when you rewatch this time, you really notice that Vince wanted her to work out so, so bad. Whenever you think he's done pushing her, he picks things right back up again. In this instance, he made her out to be the former Marine fighting for her daughter and husband. A husband that looks like Johnny Gargano and a daughter that barks at Sasha Banks. But now we come to the final act of 2019. And it's about to get really, really good. I want you to imagine you're just channel surfing on a random Friday, just can't find anything to watch, nothing's piquing your interest, but then you finally find it. You find that one medium that you haven't checked up on in years. You flip the channel and the programming banner at the bottom reads WWE Friday Night Smackdown. After you forgetting about it, after you having that weird stage of not watching because everyone tells you it's fake, you finally find it and now you want to see what's going on. Who's still here that you remember? What are the big storylines? You're coming back to watch WWE and you're going to give it another chance. Only to see a big Samoan dude getting drizzled with dog food as he's tied up to the ring post where he cannot move. What kind of nightmare Vince McMahon fetish was this? It's like Vince stumbled across one of those Florida man headlines and went, wait, I have a Florida man. I bet I can make those headlines too. So he scrolls through them and he reads them. Florida man arrested for throwing alligator through drive through window. Florida man gets tired of waiting at hospital, steals ambulance and drives home. Florida man arrested for assaulting girlfriend with fried chicken. Florida man showered in dog food by ex-football player after identity mistaken for real life canine. All of these are real by the way. So with that piece of professional wrestling history out of the way, the year comes to an end. And in retrospect, you had so many eyeballs on you and this is the best foot you're putting forward. I don't particularly think that WWE nailed this at all. 2019 is gone and now comes 2020. I don't know about you guys, but this feels like a lost year for wrestling in general. You have the obvious moments that you remember, Edge, Roman, the Boneyard match. But when I think of SmackDown during this time, it's a bit of a blur. I've simultaneously been working on a video looking back at pandemic pay-per-views. There's so much that's lost. There's so many attempts to do things. Some work out, most don't. There's so many forgotten pushes and segments, and the whole timeline is shrouded with the asterisks of the COVID year. Before fully diving into SmackDown in 2020, I have to briefly touch on WWE Backstage, which was a product of the Fox partnership. It was a studio show which aired on FS1 Tuesday night a roundup of what was happening in the WWE where Renee Young was joined by panelists discussing the goings on of current day WWE. It wasn't anything groundbreaking if you've seen one of these shows you've seen them all but it's remembered most for the time CM Punk rocked up to be a panelist and many speculated that this would be the start of him coming back to the WWE but the contract was only with Fox and not WWE directly. But here's 2020 in all of its mashed up glory. On the very first episode of the new year we we got returns galore. On the same episode, The Uso, Sheamus, and John Morrison. The latter of which was executed in a strange way. He just showed up during a backstage segment out of the blue with the rumble coming up that pop could have been reserved for what was an already elite match. This year, both rumble winners came from Raw and went on to challenge for the NXT and Raw titles. I don't know if it was to compensate for this year, but the next year, 2021, both winners ended up going for a SmackDown title, so things evened out. I'll get there in a bit because 2021 was a great year for SmackDown, but first we have unresolved business. Business that can only end with eating dog food. Gonna be pretty niche here, but for all my Superstore fans out there, you guys remember the episode where Glenn ends up making Cloud9's creator's son eat dog food as revenge for making his dad eat it years beforehand? The line was, there are two types of people in this world, weak people who eat dog food and strong people who make them eat it. Well, the strong person in this case was Roman Reigns who made Corbin quotation marks eat dog food which was later followed by a steel cage match the ultimate combination of blood rivalry resolution what a dynamite pairing that is first loser eats dog food match then a steel cage match 
But that was now all in the past. We were headed towards WrestleMania 36. The question now was who was going to be Universal Champion walking into the show. We had Goldberg and Bray Wyatt at Super Showdown, which Goldberg ended up winning. And then Bray just kind of awkwardly stared at him for a while because why not? WWE took the title off Bray because they wanted to run two massive matches on the SmackDown side of things. The first, Roman and Goldberg with the title on the line, and then John Cena versus The Fiend. Two colossal matches were confirmed for WrestleMania in short order, but fast forward to March 6, 2020, and that was the last SmackDown where fans would be in attendance, as we got the great shutdown of 2020. WWE now moved operations to an empty performance center where Triple H welcomed us in. One thing that's become exceptionally funny in today's WWE is how Triple H really, 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 really badly needs attention. He needs to be the first person out whenever there's a premiere or a big show or some sort of special event. He cuts the same promo. He says so much without saying anything at all. Flashbacks to 2003. And of course, he did it here too. He welcomes us into the show, pumps up how state of the art the WWE PC is. Of course, like many of us know, everything rapidly changed, but WWE programming wise felt like they wanted to keep things relatively the same. They wanted to keep them how things were penned out in the first place. I say this because, as a lot of you guys know, with the changing times, WrestleMania shaped out much differently, but both of those two big matches that I just mentioned were just building normally. And we also got Gronk. He was there. One storyline I haven't mentioned yet is a storyline that gained more and more traction as time went on. The love story of Otis and Mandy Rose. This had super humble beginnings and eventually became very interesting. Big meaty man Otis started to help Mandy win her matches as a romantic gesture after the two exchanged gifts. They then did the whole she loves me, she loves me not bit with Otis because we came to Valentine's Day where Dolph Ziggler bamboozled everyone, taking Otis's place on the date with the big talking point being that Mandy left Otis high and dry. But it wasn't Mandy's fault because we'd later come to know that Sonya Deville was the one behind it. She didn't want Mandy anywhere near him. This was revealed by the SmackDown hacker, which as mentioned earlier was another attempt to do something but a failure in the execution. For those not in the know, it was this hooded, ominous figure who had cameras backstage on SmackDown. They saw what was really happening in WWE locker rooms. Back to the storyline, this led to Dolph Ziggler and Otis at WrestleMania before it shifted to Sonya and Mandy heading into SummerSlam with the loser leaving WWE. The person who was leaving WWE, at least for the time being, was Roman Reigns. Unlike most Samoans, he actually pulled out of WrestleMania, of course, right? Not like there's eight Samoans that spawn onto my screen out of nowhere every single week, right? Like, bro, like, how, why do you guys reproduce so much? Like, With COVID becoming more of a threat to health and safety, Reigns decided to stay home with his family and look after himself, giving up the match with Goldberg. Braun Strowman ended up taking his place at the event, and he wasn't exactly lighting the world on fire at the time. With Braun, it just kind of felt like the ship had sailed, and this first world title win should have came a few years beforehand. In any case, following WrestleMania, WWE explored a new program, something that I remember thinking could be really good considering the history. Bray Wyatt vs. Braun Strowman, giving us chapters into the Wyatt family saga with Wyatt using brainwashing tactics to ask where the old Braun Strowman went, asking why he left him high and dry, to come back to him and while he's at it, give him the Universal Championship back. If not, Bray would destroy what he created. It was this weekly internal struggle of Braun not wanting to go back to Bray now having become his own person, while the other side slowly became more and more deranged, unable to crack the monster's head. More and more fed up with the fact that the guy who was once at his side was now ready to conquer the world on his own. We had a swamp match where Alexa Bliss appeared to try to get in Strowman's head, WWE teasing that Alexa and Braun had much more than just a simple friendship. You had this slow burn of Alexa becoming more and more like The Fiend because, as they never forgot to tell us, if you encounter The Fiend, you'll never be the same. After Money in the Bank, Braun was in this comedy feud against Miz and John Morrison, who deserved their props for how much they put themselves out there during this time. Some of the stuff landed while other times it was a miss, and I feel like these guys are underappreciated 
underappreciated MVPs of this timeline. They released a diss track about Braun Strowman telling him that he was worse than Lana's TikToks and Braun was a dork because he wore Crocs. They also played hideout in a van pulling pranks on Strowman from messing with his protein shake to attempting a Nickelodeon slime bit and then smashing his car. Speaking of cars, the most controversial story at this time came to us courtesy of Jeff Hardy and Sheamus. The charismatic enigma was framed for drunk driving by the Celtic warrior. The company had been doing these three minute mini retrospectives on Jeff and his battle with drug and alcohol abuse. So WWE explored this in a deeper sense by having Sheamus be the final hurdle to prove that Jeff was completely fine. At one point, Sheamus tried to get Jeff to drink with a toast, even forcing him to take a urine test to comply with their upcoming match. It really got people talking whether you were a fan of it or not. WWE ran the Intercontinental Championship Tournament with the final being AJ Styles and Daniel Bryan which was absolutely fantastic. Matt Riddle debuted shortly after and immediately beat AJ Styles though not for the championship. They really gave Riddle the ball before he was pulled from TV because of the speaking out movement. He had this segment called Know Your Bro where he would repeatedly say the word bro and tell us that that simple word could convey multiple different emotions but what was the worst part of smackdown in the summer i want you to really really think what was the worst part karaoke contest i don't really know why they did this lacey evans literally turned heel because she lost hashtag naomi deserves better trended online because of how cringe inducing and just terrible this was i don't know what place this has in I don't know. I, I just I just don't know. We're going to continue to talk about the bad because we have to mention Retribution, a group of ragtag misfits looking to destroy the WWE, but this thing was dead on arrival. They put them all in this Mad Max gear and had them pull off these silly pranks where their mannerisms literally look like some bad guys you'd fight off in a video game. Not like final bosses, not like a hard level, like literally just a bunch of goofs running around. They tried to make this thing intimidating a la Nexus 2010, but again, the group had these goofy mannerisms that you couldn't find them menacing. The whole thing was done after a few months, and considering how hot it started off, the tide could have been turned for the group, but it never was. After SummerSlam 2020, I feel like SmackDown really started to take strides towards what would be a fantastic 2021. Braun Strowman and Bray Wyatt were given the main event slot of SummerSlam with Roman Reigns returning after Bray won the title off Braun, and it's really amazing how a compelling, fresh character can shift the landscape of a show. For the rest of the Fox era, it was the Roman Reigns show, showing how important it is to have one focal point as the main cog of the show. The first order of business was aligning with Paul Heyman before winning the Universal title a few days later. That was also the same episode where Sami Zayn returned with the original Intercontinental Championship after he was stripped of the title but he just didn't want to let it go so they crowned a champion in his absence. This led to another really fun character to keep tabs on because he perused around proclaiming that he was the real Intercontinental Champion, saying that there was a conspiracy theory going on, and then of course the awesome rivalry between Sasha Banks and Bayley. For the longest time, these two were the best of friends bonded by how long they'd known each other and the ups and downs of their relationship. With Bayley holding the SmackDown Women's Championship, it meant that Sasha was right by her side at all times. And the one constant was that Sasha always took the bullet for Bayley without Bayley reciprocating the favor. The two at one point held all the main roster women's championships and were the absolute workhorses of the company going to all three brands. But then comes the fall, and when it was Bailey's turn to help Sasha, she didn't repay the favor. You thought it was going to be Sasha who ended up snapping, but it was Bailey who snuck things out before Sasha did anything, leading to a fantastic Hell in a Cell match between these two, where Sasha ended Bailey's reign and became the SmackDown Women's Champion. It's really weird these swings you get within the product where at points there's nothing, then everything is happening all at once and you have so much good content to consume. You go from a women's world title feud of Tamina and Bayley to Sasha and Bayley. You go from the Intercontinental Championship just kind of being there to it being elevated with guys like Jeff Hardy, Sami Zayn, and AJ Styles competing for it. And then of course, Roman Reigns brainwashing his poor cousin, eventually forcing him to wave the white towel and do his dirty work. 
We now came to the 2020 version of the WWE draft. Roman Reigns stayed on SmackDown. Same with Sasha Banks. Seth Rollins was a massive move that the company made. The New Day was split up to have Big E on his own. Kevin Owens ended up being a fantastic addition to Friday nights. And Bianca Belair was the sleeper pick of the entire draft. As The Miz made the move over to Raw, they shipped off the Money in the Bank briefcase with them after he beat Otis at Hell in a Cell. Let's be honest, Otis should have never had the contract. Or if he did, it should have had a clear direction. I've been over this so many times. I just want to see the glory days of Money in the Bank come back. Anyways, we got the yearly dose of brand supremacy right after. Uh, not with you, though. You you don't matter anymore. We don't, we don't really care about you. Drew McIntyre and Roman Reigns did some really compelling work. I always say it. Roman's character was made for the Thunderdome. It was primetime viewing. As we ended things on SmackDown for the year, Carmella was repackaged, feuding with Sasha Banks. I thought her character was really well done considering what it was trying to achieve. Roman Reigns murdered Kevin Owens every chance he got with him retaining the Universal Championship in a great steel cage match on the Christmas edition of SmackDown. This also featured a great triple threat elimination match for the women's tag titles and Big E winning the Intercontinental Championship off Sami Zayn. 2020 for SmackDown, I wouldn't say is one of the landmark years. It features a lot of important segments towards the back half of the year, but a majority of it was not the greatest. The next year, honestly, electric. This isn't me just saying it now that time has passed. I was saying it at that time too. SmackDown in 2021 had a really solid year. The show benefited from Roman Reigns being full-time, fresh stars at the top of the card, and consistency. 2021 was the best SmackDown had on Fox. The previous year, none of the Royal Rumble winners were booked to challenge for a SmackDown title, but this year the brand was given a boost by both Rumble winners. Though the initial stages of Bianca and Sasha weren't great, it got going closer to WrestleMania. They ran the Can They Coexist storyline with the pair challenging for the women's tag team titles and the weird bit where Reginald had a crush on Sasha. Then they did the whole you picked me because I'm better than you type beat. The match ended up being great, but the initial time spent after the rumble with these two wasn't a hit. And I don't think many people will debate that. But the headliner, the big one, the title match was Edge versus Roman Reigns. Not before they paraded Edge around to all three brands and really stretched things out because, of course, they just had to. Roman Reigns demanded that Edge acknowledge him as the main event of WrestleMania because remember, this was when Roman was just asking and begging for people to fight him. You had to bring back up without my blessing. Paul will not make a move on you. Roman before Mania defended his title at Elimination Chamber against the winner of the number one contenders chamber match which was Daniel Bryan. The match happening literally right after and here's where WWE ended up changing the main event because Bryan simply said things weren't fair. He wanted another title match also telling Edge that he didn't think he was good enough to beat Roman so Bryan beat Jay in a steel cage match to earn a title opportunity at Fastlane. In the build Edge had his first singles match in 11 years on Smackdown to determine the special guest enforcer which he ended up winning long story short we got a triple threat match and i remember absolutely hating this decision at the time edge and roman felt like the natural main event but hey i'll admit i was wrong the match was fantastic all hell broke loose on smackdown and it was just a good time because you had three hungry men telling you that they would be the one to take the title home once the lights went down in tampa the rest of the smackdown side was headlined by returning seth rollins taking on cesaro apollo cruz now with a nigerian accent that happened literally within the same promo like he went from normal accent to nigerian accent he was taking on Big E and Sami Zayn and kevin owens reignited their rivalry a lot of moving pieces on smackdown and following wrestlemania it was roman who was still universal champion while bianca beat sasha banks both classic main events after Mania, WWE continued with Cesaro's mini push with Roman instead more focused on Daniel Bryan, laying down the challenge for the Universal title, but with the caveat that if Bryan lost, he'd be banished from SmackDown. These two ended up having one of the best SmackDown TV matches of all time. Seriously, every time these two are in a ring together, their chemistry is out of this world. Roman was booked to pick up the win with Daniel Bryan's contract expiring and him needing to be written off TV. Roman, I kid you not, beefed the entire roster this year. We also got vignettes for Aleister Black who was set to re-debut. He re-debuted and then he was fired and that was basically the end of that it could have been really interesting it could have been another welcome addition to a very strong smackdown roster at the time 
but it didn't happen. In the May-June timeline, we had Jimmy Uso return to WWE and they ran the fall in line angle where Roman was pitting twin against twin. When both guys went after the tag team titles, Roman caused a DQ leading to a short rivalry with Rey Mysterio. This finished off in a Hell in a Cell match, but after weeks of trying, Jimmy fell in line and the bloodline was stronger than ever. Bailey and Bianca was a strong program on the women's side, with the two picking up from before WrestleMania. Both women were set to square off in an I Quit match, but Bailey ended up getting injured. Money in the Bank 2021, of course, was the first pay-per-view with fans properly since Elimination Chamber 2020, so it was a really hype time to be a WWE fan. One of the biggest strokes of genius on this year, and I think missed money for the WWE, is bum-ass Baron Corbin. Losing his crown, then slowly spiraling into losing his savings, then his car, and everything that made him the cocky jerk was crumbling down. Every week it would be this hilariousness that would ensue with him asking for money and when the crowds eventually came back, I think this worked really well. I think this could have led to a mid-card title win if they played their cards right. With SummerSlam in Vegas, Corbin played his cards right and just like that, he was rich again. As the WWE moved away from the Thunderdome, the summer for SmackDown was one of the best we'd seen in a long time. Edge returned to take on Roman Reigns, becoming a one-man wrecking crew, destroying the entirety of the bloodline on his own en route to Money in the Bank, and we finally got the match that was supposed to headline WrestleMania. The roar of the crowd was back, and that first episode with fans was magic. Actually, the whole summer with fans coming back was magic. Finn Balor returned to the main roster, we had an amazing Fatal 4-Way, Tribal Chief Roman Reigns was in front of a live crowd for the first time, but it was after Money in the Bank where things kicked into an even higher gear and we got a classic WWE summer. At least on the SmackDown side of things, poor Raw was over there with Elias and Jackson Riker. John Cena returned at the end of Money in the Bank, kicking off the summer of Cena. The final destination was Las Vegas and a mega clash between him and Roman Reigns. And I wish this rivalry was kept one on one because they made it more convoluted with Roman not accepting Cena's match. Even though Roman was just lining up people and then knocking them off a few months ago, they added Finn Balor into the mix. I guess they wanted to keep him near the top of the card and not let his momentum wane. He felt very shoehorned into the program because he was, but thankfully WWE pivoted back and we got our one on one match. These two had some very memorable promos breaking the fourth wall, Cena calling Roman by his first name saying that he's played every gimmick under the sun while Roman called Cena missionary position, did the whole you weren't good enough for Nikki Bella bit with Cena referencing Dean Ambrose and CM Punk. And if you wanted to believe that Cena might have a chance at the show, then sure you could. But they ruined that by having Roman make the step that if he lost, he'd leave the WWE. So any hope of Cena winning was gone. With two all-time greats crossing paths like that, it was exceptional as far as big money matches go. The other rivalry on SmackDown, I honestly don't have a single critique for. That's how good I thought Edge vs Seth Rollins was. Every segment, every interaction, every bit of one-upsmanship, every time the intensity was dialed up on this rivalry, it delivered and then some. It all started with Seth Rollins' obsession to win the Universal Championship, which eventually drove him to Edge. They used Edge's surgically repaired neck and the fact that Rollins' finisher was a stomp to the head neck area as a threat of danger to the health and well-being of the Rated R Superstar. What made things more compelling was how Edge was dead set on proving that this second run wasn't just going to be a miracle run. He was the same performer he'd been in days gone by. It was two mirroring images finally clashing. What would have been even more epic since Roman was the new Cena and Rollins was the new Edge in a way, it would have been massive to see Cena and Edge, the old guard, take on Rollins and Reigns before SummerSlam since the parallels are much deeper than I even knew at the time. Plus we had Sasha Banks return for the first time since WrestleMania 37. She was building up to a rematch against Bianca Belair. That didn't happen for some unknown reason as Sasha was replaced by a returning Becky Lynch. I'm trying not to get too much into the pay-per-views but this was ginormous. She won the SmackDown Women's title in seconds off Bianca, and it was a war zone when this happened. She came back as a heel, maybe seeing what Roman was doing and wanting to do the same, but you didn't really want to boo Becky at first. I feel like she really found her footing as time went on with this run. The other big talking point coming out of SummerSlam was Brock Lesnar returning to end the show, and we got Brock vs Roman part 459. The middleman in all of this was Paul Heyman, with the question being, did he know that Brock was going to be back? Roman here started two builds at once, one against Finn Balor on SmackDown, then Extreme Rules, and then also Brock Lesnar at Crown Jewel. 
Earlier I said that the premiere episode on SmackDown on Fox was alright and there were much better episodes than it. The Madison Square Garden episode of SmackDown in 2021 was one of those. An excellent match between Seth Rollins and Edge who continued their epic rivalry. Brock Lesnar sowed in the seeds of dissent between Heyman and Roman, plus a confrontation between Reigns and Finn Balor. As October came around, so did the WWE Draft. And here's where I feel like things started to go downhill. Here's where I feel like things slowly fizzled out on what was a pretty good 2021. Of course, they kept rain, Sasha Banks stayed too, Charlotte and Drew both made the move, but the problem came in the subtractions, maybe too many of these. Edge, Seth Rollins, Bianca Belair, Kevin Owens, Becky Lynch, and Finn Balor were all moved to Raw. The brand really got gutted, and as you'll see in the next bit of this retrospective, they had this idea that we'll just replenish the talent, but it didn't work out. You had this three-week overlap because the rosters didn't go into effect right away. The October 15th SmackDown, I remember this was really, really hyped up because everyone online thought that this would be the beginning of a new epic war between AEW and WWE. Media was making this out to be such a huge deal. There were YouTubers saying that this is the beginning of a new epic wrestling clash. They called it Super Size SmackDown airing on FS1. There was a contract signing between Roman Reigns and Brock Lesnar and a pretty good match between between Becky Lynch and Sasha Banks. Post Crown Jewel, the Lesnar Reigns saga continued on with the company running a suspension angle. Becky and Charlotte were the two champions switching brands and they had to switch titles in a segment as well. In it, Charlotte abandoned the script and started messing with Becky by dropping the title on the mat instead of handing it to her, which led to an argument in the back. But with the draft, SmackDown wasn't the same. Hit Row was brought in and they were just kind of there. Xavier Woods was the new king of the ring and that didn't really become sustained except for a little program with Roman Reigns because Survivor Series was coming up and he was taking on Big E. Post-draft, it still had some good moments here and there because as I always say, if you look for the good, it will be there. But it was pretty dry. Like, they tried to hype this up as a new era of SmackDown as they often do. But when you have Madcap Moss and Happy Corbin running around, I don't really know what to tell you. Lots of filler matches after a genuinely fantastic six to seven months of the brand. Like, it actually feels like I've been transported into a different timeline because this show doesn't feel the same. It doesn't feel like the SmackDown that I was just watching. It was basically just what Roman's up to, then matches like Cesaro and Monsoor versus Los Lotharios. Jinder Mahal and Shanky were out here doing mock raps to Hit Row. DJ Shankenstein, give me a beat. Oh, yes. <laughs> Rick Boogs versus Angel Garza, Drew McIntyre stuck in the Corbin Vortex, Tony Storm getting a pie thrown in her face. Like they really, really, really did not know what to do at that time. Like I said, you could see that they were being big brains like, oh, we're just going to have all these new stars and they're going to be on the rise and SmackDown is going to be the building show. But it was not. As we enter 2022, the big matchup was Roman Reigns versus Brock Lesnar after Heyman told Roman that he was on Brock's side and he ended up getting fired. The day one match never ended up happening, but with Lesnar now winning the WWE title, the company still wanted to go on with that match. This time at WrestleMania winner take all. But before that, we had a short but very epic build between Roman and Seth Rollins, which as you guys know is never bad. It's almost like they forgot they were building to it around Money in the Bank and then after sending Seth to Raw went, yeah, we got no one to challenge Roman, let's bring him back for a bit. These two's chemistry goes without saying. Charlotte entered the Royal Rumble match instead of defending her women's title. Naomi would have been the clear challenger as she got this half-hearted push while simultaneously being bullied by Sonya Deville. Sami Zayn and Johnny Knoxville was actually a blast. Like, the two leaned into the comedy bit, and I didn't even know it at the time, but big picture, this was the beginning of peak Sami Zayn. Roman vs Goldberg was just a roadblock to get to Brock and Roman at Wrestlemania in a rivalry which was so much more than just the titles. Now at blood feud stage with Brock running a forklift into the Bloodlines SUV and going full terror mode. For the women it was Charlotte and Ronda which was built on who had the better submission and simply who was better. This was a match that the company had in mind 3 years previous which was going to main event Wrestlemania 35 so they went with it. Ronda Rousey making a surprise appearance at the Royal Rumble last eliminating Charlotte to win the whole match. Charlotte called Ronda one trick pony saying that she could only win with an arm bar so Ronda did what any smart person would do. She started using an ankle lock. 
I'm actually surprised this didn't end up being a submission match considering it was right there. I also kind of shocked that Charlotte ended up retaining. Post WrestleMania, Gunther made his main roster debut, eventually winning the Intercontinental Championship later in the year, kicking off a 666 day title reign. The Usos became both Raw and SmackDown Tag Team Champions. The remnants of the New Day wrestled the Brawling Brutes like every single week. Natalia and Aaliyah was peak television. Not really. And then we had Madcap Moss and Baron Corbin. But there was one debut, one huge debut that defined SmackDown in these final few years. That was Max Dupree, a talent agent looking to scout the best of the best. And when LA Knight was repackaged into Max Dupree, people hated it. Thankfully, after a few months and honestly still killing it with that repackaged gimmick, LA Knight was reborn and he never looked back, becoming one of the most organically over wrestlers we'd seen in years. The big SummerSlam rivalry that year, anyone want to take a guess? Yeah, it's, it's Brock and Roman. This time based on who would be the most violent in a last man standing match. We'll keep this short again because how many times do people need to talk about Brock and Roman? It's consumed the WWE for so long. The match was absolutely legendary. 5 out of 5, ring lift, you know the whole deal. I was there. Fantastic. The summer also marked the end of the Vince McMahon era and Triple H took over creative for the company. His first big build was between Drew McIntyre and Roman Reigns heading into Clash at the Castle and you started to really see the Triple H flavor as he brought in his NXT guys. But also in this build was the story of Sami Zayn who was just trying to win over the bloodline by doing anything in his power. Liv Morgan and Ronda Rousey was a bumpy road we'll say, some highs, some lows. You could really tell that Ronda was disinterested with the WWE for a lot of this year. With Triple H's SmackDown, you got your returns with Bayley, Bray Wyatt was a huge one, and Karrion Cross, plus your introduction to newer NXT call-ups and the return of factions. At the end of 2022 also started an incredible storyline where Rey Mysterio wanted to quit WWE because he couldn't take getting bullied by his son anymore. More on that in a bit. But the last part of 2022 was the honorary Ooze show, just blurting out the most nonsensical stuff, saying whatever came to his mind without any thought process, making everyone under the sun break character, Ooze, my dog, his mannerisms, it was amazing. When putting together videos like this, I really realized just how consistently good Sammy was for SmackDown. Even when he wasn't the top act in 2019, he tried stuff, and that's what made things organically work. If he didn't just try crap in the Bloodline story, I don't know if Sami Zayn is in the same place he is today. Or as some of you like to say, Sami Hogan. Uh, if you're saying that, I want you to do a quick YouTube search and search for Sami Zayn 2017, 2018, or 2019. The dude was in the absolute trenches just trying to make stuff work. This man deserves it. Shout out to my Canadian guy, Sami Zayn. By year's end, we got a massive tag match with Roman and Sammy taking on Owens and a returning John Cena who wanted to continue his streak of wrestling a match every year, plus Charlotte coming back for the first time since spring to win the women's title off Ronda Rousey. I feel like this recap of the year was much shorter than the years previous because there simply wasn't as much to talk about. I don't think by comparison to 2021, this was a great year for SmackDown. This felt closer to 2020 than it did 2021. But the road to WrestleMania always gets us talking. As we move into 2023, we got Owens and Reigns Part 3 at the Rumble, which eventually led to Sami Zayn and Roman at Elimination Chamber in Sami's hometown of Montreal, which was exceptionally built because you had two options coming out of it. Either Sami overthrows Roman, or they go into Sami fighting the Usos with the internal struggle of Jay at the forefront. And the second option is the one they took. Sammy and Kevin slowly came back together after months of differences and a rocky friendship and it was really nice to see the tag team division given that big of a spotlight. Rhea and Charlotte Flair was another big one for the SmackDown Women's title. It was standard stuff, there was nothing groundbreaking about the build. At certain times it felt like they weren't even trying to make this personal but it had a very natural story to it. Then we had the battle of one-upsmanship between Drew McIntyre and Sheamus who slowly splintered off their friendship for the 65th time in hopes to win the Intercontinental Championship off Gunther. 
And then maybe the most compelling storyline going into WrestleMania between Rey Mysterio and Dominic Mysterio. I already touched briefly on Rey wanting to quit because he couldn't see his son ascending into darkness, but leading into Mania it just became this weekly troll job of Dom doing something dirty to provoke his dad until he finally snapped. You had Rey going into the Hall of Fame and then you had his son who was slowly just progressing and learning more and more as time went on. The big one was Roman versus Cody and because this was for both titles you saw the rivalry bleed into Raw and Smackdown. It was a war of words, a war of wrestling families if you will, Cody wanting to win a title that no one in his family had held and Roman upholding his legacy and wanting to continue to prove why he was the guy who was going to run the game now and for years to come. And that was proven true at WrestleMania with Roman Reigns getting the win. However, the Usos lost the tag team championships and that wasn't going to sit well. It was that simple thread that carried the WWE through the summer of the bloodline. A civil war between Jimmy and Jay and Solo and Roman. Roman was firmly on SmackDown, Raw got the new World Heavyweight Championship which was competed for in a tournament with the finals at Night of Champions, Bianca moved over to SmackDown with Rhea heading to Raw, LA Knight's popularity was at an absolute fever pitch, like seriously, the most over guy in the company at the time. But all that stuff aside, after WrestleMania, we usually move into a lull in WWE programming with stuff picking up again before SummerSlam. Through the spring and into the summer, like I mentioned, SmackDown was the bloodline show where Roman lost his patience with Jimmy and Jay, so Solo and Roman took on Sammy and Kevin for the tag team titles, and then we started to get the bloodline just breaking down week by week. First it was Jimmy, then it was Jay finally reaching his breaking point, and the civil war was on. You'd get these 20 to 40 minute segments of these guys just fleshing out their characters, this family soap opera melodrama, and you're getting all these huge, huge moments and reactions, and I think as time goes on, these segments will age pretty well. We had Jay and Roman going into SummerSlam, tribal combat style, the match wasn't good, don't even try to be a contrarian, it just wasn't good. And on the women's side, it was Asuka and Bianca who continued their rivalry from WrestleMania 39 with Charlotte entering the picture as well. I look at Lashley on SmackDown and go, they really didn't have anything for him to do. He was doing the randomest side quests, but the quest for Edge in WWE came to an end. I really couldn't think of a segue, that's, that's all I got. I'm watching back five years of SmackDown, please leave me alone. Edge challenged Sheamus to a match for his 25th anniversary and his final WWE match. It was Sheamus who indirectly led to him realizing that he could come back and wrestle in Edge's hometown of Toronto. This was brutal, this was hard hitting, and this was the perfect way for one of SmackDown's most iconic stars to go out. Out of the company, at least. The next week, Bray Wyatt and Terry Funk suddenly passed away and we got a very emotional SmackDown where there were a ton of tributes for the two legends. As the year ended, a legend returned in the form of John Cena, literally right after Edge finished. All I wanted was an Edge and John Cena interaction. All I wanted was one more match. And of course, it didn't happen. Am I mad? Yes. Do I need to let this go? Yes. Will I let it go? No. Literally right as Edge finishes off, John Cena returns for two months and I don't care what anyone says, they absolutely wasted this run. You had one of the biggest stars of all time on SmackDown every single week for two months. A John Cena appearance every single week for eight weeks was enough to set up two fresh rivalries and you could have had WrestleMania worthy matches on B and C level shows. We did have a massive ending to SmackDown where Cody Rhodes, Jey Uso, LA Knight, and John Cena took out the Bloodline and Judgment Day. We also got the return of the Great One, putting out the earliest feelers for a matchup with Roman Reigns the following year. Roman spent the end of this year in a rivalry with LA Knight, which maybe goes under the radar in Roman's run as world champion as far as rivalries go. Plus the slow breakup of Bayley from Damage Control after Io Sky's women's title win at SummerSlam and the return of Kairi Sane at Crown Jewel. Santos and Rey Mysterio was a welcome program come the end of the year. This man Santos was actually a menace to society, telling Rey Mysterio that he wished he got amputated. Randy was a huge addition to Friday nights following a Survivor Series return after nearly two years away. This, after a tough 2022, was a huge bounce back for SmackDown and a strong year for the brand. Not on the elite territory, but it was leaps and bounds from what was happening the previous year. The stark contrast between 2022 and 2023 
2023 SmackDown is very evident when you compare the two. While 2022 attempted to shoehorn people into random spots and they didn't really care if it worked or not, 2023 actually gave us more authentic and natural rivalries throughout the card. I'll always remember this year as when LA Knight took over the summer of the Samoan boys, EO Sky and Damage Control doing a great job in the latter half of the year, and you also had the pillars in place for an epic 2024. With that said, let's not waste any time. Smackdown in this year picked up after the Royal Rumble, where we had the infamous night where Cody Rhodes told Roman Reigns he wanted his title rematch after winning the Rumble, but not at WrestleMania, prompting the online community to go insane and rally behind Cody Rhodes. The video of Rock confronting Roman currently sits at 243,000 dislikes to 99k likes. Online was a war zone and people were outraged at what they had just seen, but WWE made amends and we got an absolute gem of a road to WrestleMania. Rock debuted the final boss persona, and this, I'm already inclined to say, is one of the best characters of all time. I know it's a shorter sample size, but everything he did was brilliant. Classic segments where we got shades of old Hollywood rock. Every week it was this simultaneous build for a huge tag match, but also slowly sowing in the seeds between Roman and Rock. If Cody's team won, Night 2's main event would be interference free. If Rock's team wins, bloodline rules. AJ Styles versus LA Knight was very competitive, really exceeding my personal expectations. Plus, Bailey naturally turning face and breaking away from a revamp damage control was also brilliant, even though the title reign afterwards was pretty bad. Cody got his moment at WrestleMania and it became his show. His first rivalry was against AJ Styles at both Backlash and Clash at the Castle, with a Logan Paul match sandwiched in between at King and Queen of the Ring. AJ Styles ended up pulling the Mark Henry switcheroo, faking his retirement before attacking Cody. Also in 2024, you had the debut of Tiffany Stratton, who quickly rose up the ranks in WWE and won the Money in the Bank briefcase. But it was after WrestleMania 40 where we got the debut of Tama Tonga and Tonga Loa. Solo Sokoa ran wild, building the Bloodline 2.0, the team going absolutely berserk on the roster, and eventually Paul Heyman before genuinely one of the most well-executed debuts in WWE history. If you want to make an impact, if you want to make a moment that 10, 20 years down the line somebody's going to talk about, watch how WWE made Jacob Fatu debut. He wrecked everyone and WWE stamped their next big monster. Attacking Cody Rhodes, destroying everyone in his path en route to aligning with Solo's bloodline, this whole thing was built for Roman Reigns to return, and he came back to the reaction of a lifetime. And that was the end to the SmackDown on Fox era. There's a lot to unpack. 2019 and 2020 were flat out awful. 2021, I don't know because I'm not really gauging this off of anyone else's opinion, but I really enjoyed. 2022 then went back into the bad territory, while 23 and 24 were solid. By that metric, they had one full out consistent year, and even that year was 7 or 8 months, with the show falling off a cliff towards the end of 2021. I don't really think the partnership between Fox and WWE is what Fox imagined it being. It's been reported that the company is indifferent to the WWE, with Sean Ross Sapp saying that they didn't feel like WWE was giving them good shows in 2020 and 2021, especially under Vince McMahon, but after COVID there was a much more positive reception to them. Fox CEO Lachlan Murdoch said that they chose not to renew because the return on investment wasn't what they thought it would be based on advertising numbers. SmackDown had been linked to having lower ad rates with the perception being that WWE audiences were lower income and less likely to spend money. Big picture, taking a look at SmackDown, I want you guys to just do this exercise. Just close your eyes, think of the last five years on SmackDown and eliminate the bloodline. Now tell me what you think of that show. I'm dumbfounded that they were literally on one of the biggest networks in the world and initially completely fumbled it. 3.9 million people tuned in to watch SmackDown and that was your first impression. Your first impression is so important, it's not like this was just a few week thing. This was a two year thing where SmackDown 
was not good. There were points where SmackDown was just absolutely phenomenal. But there are also points, like I said at the top of this video, that were not good. When I look back to this era 10 years from now, what's going to stick out to me? It's the summer of Cena, the summer of the Bloodline, Roman's title reign, Sami Zayn being an absolute MVP, the brilliance of the Edge and Seth Rollins storyline, The Rock's return and final boss moments, and the hollows of the pandemic era. All in all, the final takeaway from this era is while it delivered great moments post-COVID, SmackDown in 2019, 20, and 22, three of its five years was inconsistent and at times very poor from a content standpoint. A lot of peaks and just as many valleys. Sure, we had great moments, but it was the final year and a bit where things really started to pick up for the brand in terms of consistency. With all that out of the way, let me know what you guys thought of SmackDown's five-year run on Fox. And I'll see you in the next one.